now is the time for the Dhamma talk. And so it's it's good to kind of understand, you know, what is the, the Dhamma. Now, if you ask Buddhist people, they would say, well, the Dhamma is the teachings of the Buddha. But then, then you have to ask, well, what does the Buddha teach? <laughs> you taught the Dhamma. <laughs> <laughs> which came first, the Buddha or the Dhamma or the chicken or the egg. So, but uh, even the, the Buddha himself uh, stated many times that I simply rediscovered the ancient path. I re rediscovered the ancient eternal truth that's within every person. And it just happened to have been uh, covered over and layered over through the course of evolution uh, with so many layers of uh, uh, habits, confusions, wrong views, uh, delusions, and, uh, and so on. So that the, the real truth about uh, our mind has been, re has been lost. And the Buddha simply was the one who was able to uh, train himself to uh, be a mental scientist and to rediscover the ancient and eternal uh, true nature of our own mind. Uh, so to, to understand this, this mind, and especially in terms of how uh, we create suffering for ourselves, and uh, how do we experience happiness? Now, actually, the, the Buddha discovered that happiness is already right within ourselves by getting back in touch with the mind's uh, the inherent, uh, pure nature, which is basically present moment awareness, or the, the eternal present moment. Uh, which is an aspect of, of the mind that we call pure awareness. Uh, as in contrast to the, the ego, the dualistic ego mind, which normally most people are locked into. Uh, but especially the Dhamma, you know, apart from the, the nature of the mind and the the, the Dhamma is about, uh, especially the, from the, the Buddhist point of view, the, the nature of happiness and the nature of suffering. And it's the laws of nature. So that uh, suffering has, obeys the laws of nature, and happiness also is in accordance with the laws of nature. And it's similar to uh, gravity. So if you throw up a a ball, what happens? It comes down, plop, sometimes with a lot of power. So the same way, if we throw something out of our mouth, it goes out in the world, mingles with other minds, and comes back to us like a boomerang uh, to affect us in one way or another. If we throw something out of our body, like punch somebody in the nose or flip them the finger or something, then some reaction that will go out and cause some reaction to come back to us. And even with our thoughts, if, if we think negative thoughts, you know, anger, greed, hatred, or various other types of uh, unskillful thoughts, that goes out also, mingles with the world and comes back to us you know, as well as either happiness or uh, pain and suffering. Um, and the Buddha rediscovered, stated this natural law in a very nice uh, way. Uh, it goes, that all actions are led by the mind. Mind is the master, mind is the maker. If you act or speak with an impure mind, then suffering will as the cart wheel follows the foot of the ox. And in the same way, if you act or speak with the pure state of mind, then happiness will follow. As 
is your shadow follows you around. So in those two verses basically sums up really the essence of the Dhamma, at least from the Buddhist point of view, and the teachings of the Buddha in terms of learning how to uh, rediscover our true mind, and to, uh, to see through all the veils of illusion and conditioning that keep us trapped in uh, the law of karma. So the law of karma is one of these laws of Dhamma, the natural law of Dhamma, the law of nature. That, uh, that everything basically comes from our mind. So this mind is all important. And in another verse, the Buddha said that the world, the arising of the world, the ceasing of the world, and the path leading to the ceasing of the world is right within this five or six foot long body with its nervous system, memory, and consciousness. So basically it means that, you know, our experience of the world is basically comes as a, as a projection of our own condition. I mean, now this is hard to understand, but this is a, an aspect of wisdom, and this is in meditation practice. This is one of the things we're training our, our mind to see. Because basically everybody wants to be happy and free from suffering. Would anybody doubt that? Mm -hmm. right. Even down to the smallest little insects and animals, they're also just trying to find some comfort and happiness to avoid being eaten. So, but you know, people's idea of happiness is different. You know, it's based upon their desires. But uh, in this case, in the in the practice of the Dhamma, we're trying to really uh, understand the, the true nature of what is uh, really the happiness, uh, the stable and the inherent state of well-being. And you know, the, the Buddha taught about, you probably all heard about the Four Noble Truths, teaching. Anybody not hear about the Four Noble Truths? But anyway, he, he stated that, you know, suffering exists. The truth about suffering. The cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the way leading to the cessation of suffering. So he didn't directly mention happiness in that. Why? Because he didn't mean Happiness is already our birthright. Happiness is already the intrinsic nature of the mind that's resting and grounded in the present moment, free from the constraints of egotism and greed and hatred. And it's always there, just underneath the surface. So he didn't need to talk about happiness. But everybody's trying to do things to be happy, aren't they? You read it all over the place. Oh, only if you have this, you'll be happy. If you look like this, you'll be happy. Yeah. So people are doing all these things to be happy. But without understanding the cause of suffering. So that's why the Buddha emphasized understand the cause of suffering and to remove the cause of suffering. Because when you do that, you'll automatically be happy. You don't have to try to. But what happens is people are trying to do things by manipulating things. They're trying to satisfy their senses. Somehow they think that they're going to bring happiness from the outside inside. And they might get some happiness doing various things, but at the same time they do things that cause more suffering. Too. And so it negates whatever happiness they might get is nullified or negated or overweighted by the results of their other unskillful types of thoughts and action. So that's what's unique about the teachings of the Buddha, the, the, the Buddhist teaching approach to the Dhamma, uh, and why meditation is about understanding our mind. Uh, but most, you know, 
most of Western science is interested in understanding the external world, and manipulating the external world in order to uh, you know, make life more comfortable. We all know, uh, you know what that has led to, right? Raping and pillaging and plundering of the earth and its resources and the pollution and all, all those other things. So, uh, so the, the Buddha was un, uh, interested in finding the, the, the source of the world but within the mind, the source of how the, our mind creates the world. And basically he was a, a mental scientist. He was the greatest scientist. Uh, because you know the mind is the m most important thing in the universe. You know? and this mind can be used for the greatest good, and it can be all. It could be used for the greatest harm as well. You know? um, but it's, people don't have control over their mind because the mind hasn't given been given much importance. You know, even among scientists, they've given it a short shrift. Understanding the material world, that's what's important for them. It's not the mind reading. And even psychologists only understand a small portion of the mind. But the Buddha was the greatest mental scientist. And so in our meditation practice, the practice of developing mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, uh, this is like conducting a, a scientific experiment. So meditation, especially the mindfulness-based uh, vipassana meditation, insight meditation, it's like we're, you know, a scientist conducting the greatest experiment, the experiment into the nature of our own life. And so the body, the Buddha considered this body as a laboratory, and the mind as the microscope. So just as you go to a, a science lab, you you, uh, you, know, you have to go into the, get, get into the laboratory. And then you sit down at the microscope and start looking through the microscope. So the same way, we have to find this body. So the sitting posture is like finding the lab, coming to the door of the laboratory. Oh yes, sitting, sitting. And finding the external. You know, part of the body in the present moment. And then slowly as you focus on the breathing, opening that door and going inside. So first you feel the, the breathing body and this is the Buddha's exact instruction in, in, in the discourse on meditation. And keeping the posture straight because meditation happens between the brain and the spinal column because that's where all the nervous system energy in uh, daya is coming in. And so if the, if the body is, you know, the spine is not straight, then our consciousness gets dull and it, it, it remains kind of not very clear or it gets slowed down. And so the posture is, is important in the beginning uh, and then using the breath to go deeper inside and feel a subtler sensation. Because our thoughts are occurring in the deepest level of the unconscious mind. How many of you got lost in your thoughts in the meditation? What? <laughs> because you didn't see them coming, right? I mean, you wanted to, right? You wanted to stay there with the breathing, and, but without you, before you knew it, the mind was, you, you didn't see it coming. The thoughts are like an octopus. If an octopus gets one technical on you, if you catch it soon enough, without difficulty, you can pull it off. And, but if you're slow, if you're half drowsy, or you're, you know, you, you're not, distracted, the, the, thought, the thoughts have more time to work 
And it's like each time there's another tentacle put on you, it gets harder and harder to get off the octopus. Is it right? You are following it? <laughs> and if you get six or seven or eight on you, he drags you out to the sea and drowns you <laughs> and eats you. <laughs> and that's what happens to so many people in meditation. What is being drowned? It means you, you get carried away in your thoughts of greed or hatred or worry or, oh, woe with me, my problems. And, you know, it drowns you. People get kind of drowned in them. And in worst case scenarios, they might take their life, unfortunately. But that's being called eaten. Or have you going into a psychotic break. And it's simply because we have not been taught how to control our thoughts. And that's the tragedy of, you know, sort of the Western scientific approach. They call themselves scientists, but I don't think they're real scientists. Because if they were, they'd be interested in the mind. Don't you think? But it, that's not what i Because of certain religious beliefs or other types of beliefs, they you know, don't work. Uh, so anyway, uh, so in the practice of uh, meditation, we, we use this body to get to the mind. It's very difficult just to try to watch your thoughts. Because the mind is uh, operating faster than Google searching. <laughs> and because our mind is slow and it gets stuck, and it also has a lot of defilement, so we sit down and try to meditate and we kind of, you know, nod off and we're not very clear, or we get distracted easily by itches and pain. And so uh, it's like jiggling the microscope. You know, if you're, if you're trying to look through that microscope and somebody keeps bumping the table, it's going to be difficult to see what you're inside, right? So that's why you have to keep it still, keep the body still. And as you, the longer you keep the mind focused, it's like turning up the power of the microscope. And, you know, and then you, you come closer to seeing your thoughts. So this body is, you know, the doorway to reach the mind. Uh, and so first we find the external body in the present moment. And then as you keep the mind there, it starts feeling the underneath the skin. You start feeling you know, the subtle sensations, the prickling, itching sensations, pulsations, so many different little sensations. You start and so that becomes your focus as well. Like the breathing, the breathing is still there, but even at the same time, you're noticing other little sensations. And all of that helps keep the mind, keep drawing it further inward. To feel subtler and subtler sensations. And that gets you closer to the source of your thoughts. Because the thoughts are arising from that, uh, what I like to call the, the you know, the, the cellular level, the cellular vibration. So when you start to feel the subtle sensations in the body, because this body is made up of billions of cells, isn't it? And they're all vibrating. And you can actually feel that if you keep your mind focused. And when you do, then that's when you, it's easy to see your thoughts arising at you because they're arising at the same time. And when you're able to see the arising of the thought, it's still in its weak state. So let's say you're, you're meditating, you know, and you're being aware of in, in sitting, and then you notice a thought coming up, like, oh, it's too hot in here. Just be off, thinking, thinking. And you don't get dragged off by the thought. You just you notice it, you're just thinking, thinking. It usually just it knocks the power out. It allows you to stay connected to the present moment. And another thought that arises, maybe an opinion arises, and you make a note on it, opinion, you just kind of observe it. You try not to get dragged and sucked out by it, relaxing around it, keep 
that coming back to still connected to the breathing. And like that, it keeps going. And you start to uh, notice uh, just different sensations coming and going. You can even hear sounds coming and going in the background. But the mind is remaining centered there in the breathing. And it's, it's reconnected to uh, the, the present moment. See, all problems are problems of the past and future. Try to think of any problem that you have and see if it's not connected to the past or future. Okay? I'll give you 10 seconds. <laughs> oh, oh. You probably can't. So, that's the trick, you see. This body, we have, we carry this body with us around all the time. 24-7, 365, the last number we don't know how long we live. But we're carrying this body around with us all the time. Why not use it for something really valuable rather than impressing others or whatever? Use it as a basis to uh, connect with our ourself, with our, with our own mind in the present moment. When the mind is in the present moment, then that's, that's happiness because there's nothing to judge, nothing to compare, nothing to be afraid of, nothing to want, because all those are connected with the past and future. And so that's why the Buddha was a genius in learning how, in, uh, teaching about using this body as a gateway and doorway to reach the mind. But whoever tells you that, anybody tell you that? Your youth? <laughs> but, you know, it's not rocket science. It's right here all the time, free. You just feel, oh yes, I'm sitting, or I'm standing, or I'm walking. I'm feeling some sensation. And then the mind gets off that treadmill of the past and future neurotic thoughts. And so that's part of the mindfulness training, using this body to always come back to you. And uh, to reground and recenter where you catch your mind rushing too fast. Because all accidents are accidents of uh, not being centered. But the, the, there's a split between our body and mind. The body is here, but the mind is doing so many other things. And so that's why we bump into things, and, you know, cutting our vegetables for our meal and, you know, thinking about whatever, and, you know, cut the food. There's so many other accidents. It's all because our mind has been disconnected from the body. So that's one of the basic you know, teachings of very, and that's why yoga is a very uh, nice thing. That's why I integrate the practice of yoga exercise into the meditation because uh, you know it's all about yoga exercise. You know, uh, helps you get a better feeling in the body and, uh, and awaken some sensation. And the body should be a nice place to live. People don't want to hang out in their own body. <laughs> they want other bodies, right? They want to hug other bodies. What about hug yourself? In meditation, basically, you hug yourself. That means you're feeling the body and you're feeling the cells and molecules, vibrations. It's so beautiful. It's such a pleasant feeling. You want to get the mind focused on the body. And you don't care about anything else. Because there's so many pleasant sensations to be had. Once you're, you get beyond the gross hindrances and start to feel that organic aliveness of the body, it's so natural. Because it's your natural awareness. You know, the body and mind were born together at the moment of conception. And for nine months in the womb, that's all the mind awareness knew was tremendous evolution going on. From one cell organism to a multi-billion 
crew and so on in the space of nine months. So, you know, the body and mind are basically you now born with it. But unfortunately they become separated. Uh, so that's really the first stage of mindfulness is learning how to get really grounded and connected with the body. And then by deepening one's uh, meditation practice. So meditation starts with mindfulness. Basically, mindfulness means to remember. But to remember the present moment. And starting with the body. Oh, yes. Right now I'm sitting. Just keep remembering. You're standing, standing, standing. Or if you're lifting your arm, Whatever you're doing with the body, just remember, what is this body doing? And your mind would be in the present moment. And that's the, the entry to awareness. So, and then that gets you, as I mentioned before, so the, you get centered in the body and then you start feeling the subtler sensations you know, under the skin, the subtler vibrations. And then, then that takes you to be able to directly observe the arising of your thoughts and urges and emotions so you can catch them when they only have one leg on you and you can easily out thinking people on the and, uh, keep uh, staying connected to the, the present moment. So, you know, meditation practice is according to the, the, the Buddhist method. Is you know, the stages of mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. So the mindfulness helps us to get relaxed and centered, and reconnect more or less to the present moment, and being able to watch and let go of our negative thoughts or other distractions, useless type of thoughts. You know, people waste so much time that they're just thinking about mostly useless things. The things that are not really that important. Or rehashing things that they know they, they can't control. Because you know, simply we haven't been trained. So my, uh, meditation is a mind trick. And meditation comes from the same root as medicine. Uh, M-E-D-I. Basically, it means the middle. Mediation, meditation, medicine. It all refers to the same kind of phenomenon about bridging between the extremes. Medicine helps you to balance between health and sickness. Medita the pre meditation helps you to stay in the present moment between the past and the future. And a mediator helps to resolve disputes between warring parties, right? So mindfulness and meditation uh, is as the same thing. It's the middle ground between ignorance and wisdom. Not knowing the truth and being reconnected with the truth of awareness. Uh, but anyway, it you know, starts with the mindfulness. And when you're mindful, you'll, it's very easy to become concentrated. Because the mindfulness means the letting go of distractions. And when you're not distracted, the mind naturally will come back and rest in the present moment, which is concentration. Concentration means resting in the present moment. Not necessarily absorbed in one object, although it could be, but it means resting in the present moment, not being distracted. And wisdom is the combination. There's a little formula. Mindfulness plus concentration equals wisdom. And what is wisdom? Wisdom basically is seeing the pure nature of consciousness free from the, the, the ego domination. 
Because as you gain concentration and the mind starts letting go of the past and the future, the mind actually re reverts back to its intrinsic vibration of the present moment. In the sense that the I and the me kind of fades away. Because one of the cornerstones of the Buddhist teachings is about no self. That the idea of our idea of me and I is something we've created. It's not part of the pure mind. The ego consciousness is a, is we've created that from, this, from right after the time of birth. When you were born, you don't even have a sense of I or me in your consciousness. But after about six months with the baby, you give it a name, you start giving it things, and it's gradually the, the, the nucleus of the me starts to form inside and it gets caught in this Buddhist world and, and loses its intrinsic present moment of I mean, I have to do that to, to live, but the problem is we've never been told about it. We've, been, we've never been told, that, hey, you know, keep that connection to the present moment. Don't it it's going to be useful later on. So wisdom is the direct observing. When, you, when your mind gets relaxed and more focused in the present, letting go of the distractions, then that sense of ego starts to fade away. You can directly see it. You, you directly experience it. And it's, for the most part, it's a very liberating experience. Because basically, we're in a prison of our ego, ego's thoughts. I mean my, and all its worries and fears and all this stuff is connected to, to the eye, and people become like a prisoner for that. It's tragic, but the good news is it doesn't have to be that. And the Buddha gives us the technology, the mental technology, to actually transform our mind. Uh, so, there's many other things that could be uh, uh, said about that, but uh, basically, uh, you know, that process of you know, training the mind, of mindfulness, concentration, you know, it's, it's the wisdom that sets you free when you actually discover the truth about the Lord mind. And so when you meditate and you start understanding and observing, subtler things that are happening with your, you know, within your own consciousness. Seeing how everything is impermanent. It's a very exciting action. Like a scientist getting close to discovering the, you know, the cure for the disease. You get so excited and full of energy, you can stay up day or night for eating without eating. Because it's so interesting. So meditation becomes like that. Once you overcome the ghost hindrances, so that's the hardest part about meditation, is overcoming the gross hindrances of drowsiness and sleepiness, of uh, greed and desire for external things, and uh, remembering anger and anger about others, uh, and just restlessness, always worried about the past. So once those are overcome, Meditation becomes very easy. So, anyway, I think I uh, uh, might stop with this Dhamma uh, talk here and uh, invite you to ask any questions about the things that uh, are very rich in the meditation practice. So, feel free to. Uh, <laughs> so did the uh, the yoga part help you more than did you find that accelerated your ability to meditate better? Yes. Because it helps to minimize the pain. And uh, because of that, because pain is one of the big distractions of meditation. And most pain is due to stiffness, 
Mm. Uh, 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 you know, the light force not being able to get through the joints, you know, that stiff and the muscle tissue is densely compacted. So, you know, the psychic energy, the electrical energy, the body, the prana, the chi, whatever you want to call it, you know, can't really penetrate. And so, uh, it causes not only that, but other good effects uh, too, it just helps you be more relaxed. And, and also to sit straight. So exercise that helps strengthen your back muscles and spine, those are really the, the best ones because that's, that's the hardest part for people to do is to be able to hold the, the body straight for more than 15 or 20 minutes because gravity will just you know, kind of putting them down. You don't have the strength to, to resist that. Um, so, did you find that more in, in the non-Buddhist tradition? Where did you pick all that yoga technique up? Well, in my own experience, I first uh, did a, a, a meditation course in Tibetan meditation in Nepal. But during that course, there were some guys in the lunch break, or girls, too, <laughs> uh, doing some yoga. And I didn't know really what yoga was. I was watching them and I asked them, what are you doing? I said, yoga, yeah, and he talks. I watched them and I started doing it a little bit. And then after that, I thought, oh, no. I feel a little bit more comfortable you know, uh, like that. So that's how I got into it. But later, I studied with a yoga teacher in India for six months. And, uh, lived in the ashram and whatever. So when I started teaching meditation, I'm one of the few Buddhist monks that actually teaches or integrates in yoga. How many of you are coming to the retreat in uh, Rockaway Beach this weekend? <laughs> well, I am. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's usually how I do. Uh, just like if you were here at the beginning, we did a few stretches, so you know, include those plus there's a whole series of other ones. If you, often go into one of the time and place here. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, I have visited a couple of temples um, in Korea, so I'm not sure what, the, like, what they were practicing necessarily, but we did a lot of prostrations. We did like a series of 108 prostrations that I felt were like actually really helpful in connecting in like centering my mind and body together, and I was just wondering like what's the um, like use of prostrations in um, meditation and Buddhism, and like how they can be used. Well, prostrations are used in most schools of traditional Asian Buddhism, but it's done in different ways, uh, and so the. The Korean people, I, I, I've been to those temples, so I know basically how they do it. And the Tibetans do it, they, they lay down full, flat out on their stomach with their hands out in front, and they stand back up. And, and then in the, uh, like Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Burma, they do it from a kneeing position. So they're all, and it's just ways that that's developed because of the culture, the mindsets, and some of the other philosophical views. But basically, Prostration is a way to humble the ego. Because, you know, as Westerners, we, I have a PhD. Why should I bow to this natural? Bow to this person. We're all equal. Like, you know, that's all this ego. And that's uh, one of the main blockages of getting, you know, deeper inside of ourselves is the ego. So it's done as a way to humble oneself. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, as exercise to. Uh, Doing that a hundred and eight times. <laughs> so. But we don't force that to bother people. It's got to be done. You know, people have to understand what it is that we know. If you feel like you're doing it, you know. Do you, um, maybe talk a little bit about um, the connection between feeling pleasure during meditation and also? seeing the impermanence of the body and the sort of not-self nature of the body. Because I always, I'm sure because I don't really have that wisdom, but the, those two ideas or feelings seem to pull in different directions. No, there's, there's a pleasurable, there's different types of pleasurable feelings. 
One is the pleasurable feeling you get when you, you know, you eat some nice food, mm -hmm. or hear some nice music, or see something pleasurable feeling. That's stimulated by senses, sense, what's called sensual pleasurable. And then there's a pleasurable feeling that comes more from inside, like feeling the subtle vibrations of cellular vibrations and so on, which is also kind of a uh, sensual feeling, but you're getting closer to the mind. And when the mind is in the present moment, that's a mental pleasurable feeling. That's not the physical pleasurable feeling. That's a mental pleasurable feeling because the mind in the present moment, there's nothing not to like. And because there's no fear, there's no desire, there's no sense of losing anything or gaining anything or anything. The, the mind is full and complete in itself. So it's called that intrinsic uh, uh, mental pleasurable feeling. And that's ultimately what we're trying to connect with. So understanding the body as being impermanent and changing, that doesn't affect this uh, mental pleasurable feeling. But because we get stuck in the body pleasurable feelings, those are what's in front of and they don't last. And so we have to keep on trying to get them, like drug addicts it's addicted to drugs. They want that rush, right, or addiction to sex, or whatever it may be. But these are, uh, you know, these are intense uh, physical uh, sensations. Uh, but they're all impermanent. And, and, uh, but when you reach the mind, you reach the present moment and equanimity of the mind, that has nothing to do with the physical. And that doesn't change. Because that's just uh, basically the, the, the nature of awareness. It's not uh, connected or bothered by any of the other changes. But it's very difficult for the average person. Understand because we've been so addicted to one is the sensual pleasure of objects, and whatever fleeting little moments of pleasure that brings. But you know, again, they're, they're short lived, and they usually bring on painful consequences a lot of the time uh, because we fight and quarrel and kill over trying to protect our pleasurable feelings. Get rid of our painful feelings. Because people don't know, know, they don't have any alternative. And that's why meditation is the alternative. Um, so, are there any techniques other than meditation to break the identification with the ego? And, and should, should there be identification with something else? Instead of, the, instead of the ego? There should be identification with awareness. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's why people take psychedelic drugs, because it temporarily inhibits the ego consciousness. And that's why it was popular with the hippies back in the day, even myself. Part of that culture. <laughs> <laughs> I use meditation to, uh, to uh, be able to reach the kind of states without all the things. Mm -hmm. not advocating mm -hmm. things. <laughs> they're not to be controlled. That's the danger. And many people were led to their death by being deluded by the kind of sensations that they get on them. So. Drug And if you're interested, I've written my autobiography that tells how I was born, grew up in California, and, uh, in the U.S. Army, in the Vietnam War, and I followed the hippie trail from Europe to India, where I uh, stayed stoned all the time with drugs, and got busted in Afghanistan, and barely got out with my life. And after that, I, by you know, some fate of karma, I, 
I've heard about meditation course, that's what I have to do, otherwise I'm going to die or overdose or something. It changed my life. Anyway, I wrote my, uh, a story about that. My you can read it on my blog. You can Google in my name, Bhante uh, Rahula, <laughs> or Yoga Vachara Rahula. In fact, before I forget it, uh, can you bring me my bag? Mm -hmm. I brought some little books that I wrote, you know, about the body mind connection, uh, about integrating yoga with meditation, and uh, you can have one if you like. But these books are also on my blog, if you go to my blog, which is banterohula.blogspot. There's a lot of interesting things on that blog, including lots of YouTube uh, uh, Dhamma talks, you know, on YouTube, uh, some yoga demonstrations and things like that. A few books that are written. Well, as I mentioned, I started with the Tibetan meditation course in Nepal, which is basically Mahayana. And they're, they're, you know, it got me hooked on the Dhamma, but then as I came down into India and I started to read about the Theravada mindfulness, Vipassana type of meditation, I got interested in that. And then I went to a course in Vipassana meditation, which is focused on, you know, focusing in the body and body sensation and so on. Uh, more of the Theravada kind of uh, Vipassana approach. So uh, that I got more, started to get more interested in that. And that took me to Sri Lanka, where becoming a monk was very easy and people supported. So uh, you know, it's sort of like they chose me, it's not that I chose it. And, uh, everyone gravitates to different uh, traditions and methods, depending on you know, the past karma and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. I'm satisfied with this kind of thing. Because the mindfulness Theravada approach is more, uh, it's less kind of guru dependent. You know, when Tibetan Buddhism and other traditions, uh, it's sort of all kind of different rites and rituals also. You know, so. mm -hmm. The Theravada approach is a more uh, Using the strength of your own body and mind to conduct this experiment, you know, understanding your own 